Welcome to Healthy Focus, the Duke Raleigh Hospital Community Education Series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zimmer. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mandy. Um, thank you all for uh, taking time out uh, to come here tonight and um, listen to me discuss a topic which I find to be uh, very important. As Mandy said, I am the Director of Cerebrovascular and Skull Base uh, Surgery uh, for the Duke Health System. And tonight's conversation uh, or presentation is going to be about brain aneurysms. I'd like to hit on a few topics relating to brain aneurysms, specifically what is a brain aneurysm, how often do they occur, what do you do if a family member has a brain aneurysm, what we do to treat brain aneurysms and to evaluate um, these brain aneurysms. Uh, my practice is uh, located at both Duke Raleigh Hospital and the main Duke uh, Hospital in Durham. Uh, I see patients in clinic uh, and oftentimes, actually more often, uh, through the emergency room. Uh, I do surgery for uh, brain aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations as well as tumors at the base of the uh, skull. Uh, I also have had training in interventional radiology and can treat aneurysms using uh, catheters uh, in the angiosuite as well as um, treating uh, carotid disease. So. Just uh, looking out here, I actually see some of my uh, uh, patients in the audience, and I just want to get a sense, how many of you uh, have had a brain aneurysm or are familiar with someone who's had a brain aneurysm? That's, uh, that's quite a large portion. Brain aneurysms are a very scary uh, diagnosis to get. Uh, most uh, of us in the, in the common um, culture think of it as a ticking time bomb uh, inside the head. And when you're told that you have a brain aneurysm, it, it can be devastating and it can change your life completely. So uh, what I'd like to do is to share with you some, some information about these brain aneurysms and discuss some of the ways that we go about uh, treating the brain aneurysms. So what is a brain aneurysm? Basically, it's an area of weakness that develops on the wall of one of the blood vessels uh, inside the brain. And as this uh, uh, blood vessel gets weak, the pressure of blood pumping and hitting against that uh, uh, blood vessel and against that weak point causes it to start to uh, bulge out. And over time, that little bulge can start to collect blood on its own and it can start to grow, much like a water balloon. And the problem is that as these things grow and stretch, they can cause symptoms just by their sheer size or most unfortunately, they can tear and cause bleeding uh, inside the brain. So this is what a uh, brain aneurysm looks like if you look at the wall of it under a microscope. On the top part of this slide, um, right here, is a normal blood vessel. You can see it's got a very nice organized shape to it. You don't need to be a pathologist or a doctor to be able to see that. You have these thick, uh, elastic tissue that runs around the wall of the blood vessel much like a, a spring does, and that gives the wall of the blood vessel a lot of ability to stretch and to, to take on the pressure of the blood coming into it. This is the wall of a, blood, of, of a blood vessel where there has been an aneurysm. As you can see, that normal architecture has been completely destroyed. And once that architecture is destroyed, every time your heart beats and pumps blood into that uh, blood vessel, it can't stretch and it can't conform to that pressure and as a result it starts to bulge out and form an aneurysm. The aneurysms typically uh, occur at the base of the skull and I'll show you some uh, images of that and there are several different types of aneurysms that we see inside the head. In this picture here you can see the three main types that are important. The saccular aneurysm is this one here. This is where the, the weakness on the wall of the blood vessel is just in one point or one small portion of the blood vessel. And that takes the blunt of the pressure, and as a result, you just balloon out the aneurysm in just one spot on the artery. These are particularly bad actors. These are the ones that we think of when we think of a brain aneurysm. These are the ones that can grow and stretch and get to a point where they can rupture and bleed quite commonly. Another type of aneurysm is this one here, the fusiform aneurysm. In a fusiform aneurysm, instead of just having one spot get weak, 
the whole circumference all around the blood vessel gets weak. And as a result, the blood vessel dilates or stretches circumferentially in a very uniform fashion. These tend to not be as aggressive as the saccular aneurysms. The worst type of aneurysm is this dissecting aneurysm. Uh, and a dissecting aneurysm is just like a blood blister. Basically what happens is the wall of the blood vessel tears, and instead of that tear going all the way through, it's just a partial thickness tear. And what that allows uh, to happen is blood can come in through that torn area and dissect or stretch the outside wall of the blood vessel and fill it with blood just like a blood blister. These also behave in a very aggressive fashion. So where are these aneurysms typically located? They're located at the base of the skull. This is a CT scan of the head, and as you rotate the head and remove the brain, you can see where all the blood vessels uh, inside the uh, brain are located. They're basically in a plane that you draw from the midpoint of your pupils all the way back behind your ears to the base of your head. That's where all the blood vessels um, uh, of the brain are, and typically aneurysms form at points where these blood vessels split. Okay, These are called bifurcation or branch points. And that makes sense because if there is a weak spot at this branch point, for example, what happens is the blood that's being pumped up from the heart is coming in this direction and a lot of force is being transmitted into this branching point. And then that branch point is what forces the blood to split and to go into each of these two blood vessels. So if there is a weak spot here, that's going to stretch that out and develop an aneurysm. For the purposes of knowing how aneurysms can behave, we divide the head into an anterior and a posterior circulation. And that line of demarcation is basically a line that goes across here, which is about the midpoint of your temple. Everything in front of that is your anterior circulation, and everything behind that, for all intents and purposes, is your posterior circulation. So what, what are some things that can cause a brain aneurysm? Well, there's only a few specific uh, diseases that we know which can cause a brain aneurysm. Basically, based on what I've told you, these are diseases that interfere with your body's ability to make structural proteins, right? If you can't build a good solid structure in the walls of your blood vessels, chances are you're going to develop an aneurysm. That's what this Marfan syndrome and this Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are. These are problems which you can, and diseases which you inherit, which keep your body from producing the appropriate types of collagen or other connective tissue proteins, and as a result, your blood vessels are particularly fragile. There's a couple of other diseases, the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and homocysteine urea disease, which also uh, can cause damage to the walls of the blood vessels. These things you can't do anything about, but there are some risk factors which you can modify, which can hasten your development of an aneurysm, or if you have an aneurysm, promote its growth uh, by weakening the walls of the blood vessel further. These risk factors are smoking, heavy alcohol use, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, so poor sugar management, and the use of certain recreational drugs, cocaine and amphetamines, chief amongst them. Cocaine and amphetamines typically tend to run up your blood pressure and damage the, uh, the, the walls of your blood vessels, so that's why those also can predispose you to the development of, of aneurysms. Aneurysms occur in about, or exist in about 5 to 10 percent of the population. Uh, that's uh, roughly 25 million uh, people. And the problem is that about 30,000 of these aneurysms rupture every year. And the consequences of an aneurysm rupture uh, can be catastrophic. Basically, this, this tear in the blood vessel allows the blood under high arterial pressure to spray into the space around your brain. And that in itself can cause damage to your brain. It stops, the, 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 the bleeding continues until the pressure gets to the point where there is no further blood flow, and that can allow the aneurysm to seal off. That can cause uh, damage to the brain. And then the blood that accumulates on the surface of the brain and within the substance of the brain is highly irritating to the, to the brain itself, and that can cause damage to the brain. So when an aneurysm ruptures, 
chances are more likely than not that a person will either die or have severe permanent disability. Um, and that's why we, we tend to be so aggressive with the treatment of aneurysms. So are aneurysms hereditary? There is some controversy around this. Uh, this is a question that my patients ask me uh, quite often. A single aneurysm occurs spontaneously in enough cases that we tend not to get too worried about that. However, if a person has uh, two or more aneurysms in their head, or if they have multiple direct relatives who have aneurysms, especially if they've had a history of aneurysm bleeding in their family, we recommend that the family members get screened with non-invasive uh, tests. And the most uh, uh, commonly used non-invasive test would be the MRI, uh, MRA or CTA. And I'll show you pictures of those. So the vast majority of aneurysms, right, and the 25 million uh, patients who do harbor the aneurysms either pose no symptoms and are undiagnosed until they happen to bleed, or they're found incidentally on workup for uh, some other unrelated symptom. Patients oftentimes now get uh, screening MRI scans or CAT scans for evaluation of any sort of complaints, headaches, blurred vision, double vision, anything like that. And oftentimes, that will demonstrate uh, an aneurysm in the patient. Um, the, on the other hand, if an aneurysm grows to be quite large, it can put enough pressure on the substance of the brain or on the nerves that exit the brain and go to control your eyes or your throat or your face that it can cause neurologic symptoms as a, res as a result. One of the most common uh, symptoms that an enlarging aneurysm causes is a, is a dilated pupil that does not respond to light. Because the nerve that moves your pupil, allows your pupil to respond to light, goes right by one of these blood vessels that I showed you on the CAT scan. And so it's very easy for an aneurysm to put pressure on that nerve. And anytime you compress a nerve in the body, it stops conducting electricity appropriately and it starts to malfunction. Uh, and that's what can cause vision changes. Other aneurysms, by, by virtue of their location, can irritate the lining of the brain if they're growing and they can cause patients to develop headaches, or they can push on any number of other uh, cranial nerves uh, and cause these cranial neuropathies. Like I said, when an aneurysm ruptures, it's a cataclysmic event. Uh, the, uh, its sudden death is one of the uh, commoner uh, consequences of an aneurysm rupture. For patients who don't have that, they can have the worst headache of their life. And this is one of those code words that we take very seriously when a patient come, presents to the emergency room. Uh, even patients who've had lifelong debilitating migraines who have an aneurysm to bleed will say that that aneurysm rupture, the headache that you get from that, is by far the worst headache uh, of their life. So we, 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 we take extra measures to try to diagnose uh, when a per patient presents with, uh, with that complaint. Loss of consciousness and severe neurologic deficits are the other uh, key features of a ruptured brain aneurysm. So our goal is to try to prevent this um, from happening. And that's uh, what I'm mainly going to focus on is the management of the unruptured, uh, incidentally found aneurysm. So there are several different ways that we go about getting information about the aneurysm in order to try to decide what, if anything, we need to do about it. Uh, one of the ways is the CT angiogram. These are the images that I showed you earlier. The nice thing about a CT angiogram is it gives you a beautiful, very sensitive uh, and high fidelity reconstruction of the blood vessels and in three dimensions if, if you so choose. Uh, to see them. You can see the contours of the blood vessels are very well represented, the connections of the blood vessels are well represented, and the relationship of the blood vessels to the bone is well represented. So you can plan how you're going to treat an aneurysm if you see one on this modality. The drawbacks of this is that it's a lot of x-ray radiation. We tend not to get too concerned about that, but this is, gives you much more x-ray radiation than a CAT scan does. 
The other problem with it is that you need to inject contrast dye into the patient's blood vessels in order to create these images. This means you have to put a pretty large IV into the, into the arm and you have to inject a whole lot of this contrast material. And this contrast material is then excreted through your kidneys and it can actually damage your kidneys. So for patients who have borderline kidney problems, this is not the best way uh, to go about uh, looking at, at an aneurysm. But for patients who don't have those issues, this gives you very great uh, anatomical overview. The other technique that we use is MRA. Now this is done in a regular MRI machine, but instead of tuning the machine to look at the actual substance of the brain, they just tune it differently so it looks at the blood vessels inside the head. You don't need to get any contrast and you don't need to get any radiation in order to have one of these uh, uh, tests done. This is my preferred way of screening say family members of patients who have multiple aneurysms or, or severe uh, history of, of bleeding uh, from aneurysms because it, it, it's the least risky way to do it. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you that great a detail. You can compare the image of the blood vessels you get on this picture to the ones that you got here. You can see these blood vessels fleshed out much in much greater resolution on a CTA than you can on this MRA where they almost have a shadowy or ghost-like appearance. And oftentimes, if a blood vessel uh, comes off of one of these main, main arteries and then twists around itself before going out to the brain, the machine will detect that and label that as an aneurysm. And it looks just like an aneurysm when you look at it. So I oftentimes get patients with small aneurysms on an MRA and I'll follow it up with further imaging and you know, can tell them, look, this, this is no aneurysm, this was just a, 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 an artifact of the way the machine creates these images. Which brings me to the gold standard way of getting pictures of the blood vessels in the head, and that's a catheter uh, angiography. To do a catheter angiogram, what we do is we bring a patient into the angio suite, and I'll show you pictures of that uh, later. We give some medication to, to relax the patient. We clean and, and prep the, the groin, and we feel the femoral artery. It's a very superficial blood vessel, and it's a very large blood vessel. It goes right over the head of the femur, which is the long bone of your leg. So it's pretty easy to get control of that blood vessel. We put a small needle uh, into that blood vessel, and, and through that needle, we can introduce a wire and then a catheter into that blood vessel. We then can follow this catheter all the way up to the blood vessels that, that supply blood to your brain, looking at it all the while under an x-ray machine, and then we inject our contrast directly into the blood vessels going to the head and create these images uh, of the arteries inside the brain. And for those of us who do this uh, often, this is the best way uh, to look at the blood vessels in the brain. It does use x-ray radiation, but less x-ray radiation than the CTA does. And it does use x-ray dye, but again, less dye than the CTA does. Because instead of just injecting the dye in your blood uh, stream in your arm and at such a high dose that it fills all the blood vessels in your brain, we inject very selective doses of the, of the dye just into the blood vessels that we want to look at. So once we do all of these testings, we can then look at the nature of the aneurysm and try to decide the critical question. And the critical question is, does this aneurysm pose any threat whatsoever to this patient? Because if it does, then we have to undertake some procedure to get rid of the aneurysm. And all of those procedures carry some inherent risks with them. So if the aneurysm poses no threat to the patient, it's not worthwhile to take any sort of a risk to try to treat it. And how do we go about figuring out what the risk of a given aneurysm is? The first thing we look at is the location of the aneurysm. And this is where that anterior circulation, posterior circulation difference comes into play. We have studied thousands of patients in many countries who had incidental brain aneurysms found on tests for any number of, of symptoms, right? So these are non-symptomatic aneurysms that were just incidentally found. Years to try to figure out which aneurysms are likely to bleed and which aneurysms are unlikely to bleed. 
what we've learned is that the aneurysms that are on the posterior circulation, so at the basilar bifurcation and in this artery here, which is called the PCOM, which is incidentally the one that can push on the nerve to the eye and make your pupil large, these two are the worst actors. They tend to bleed most often and they tend to bleed when they're smaller. The aneurysms in the other blood vessels tend to behave in a more benign fashion. They need to be larger before they, they have a risk of bleeding uh, or causing any problems. So the first thing is the location, anterior or posterior, and the second thing is the size measured in millimeters. Okay. So just for reference, two millimeters is the size of a nickel when you look at the thickness of a nickel when you look at it on the side. A two millimeter aneurysm has basically no risk of bleeding. And this is one that we just keep an eye on and, and follow over time with a non-invasive test. A five millimeter aneurysm is about the width of a straw. Now we're starting to get into the risky uh, area where there is greater than zero but still not a substantial risk that this aneurysm will bleed in a given year. A 10 millimeter aneurysm is the size of the tip of your pinky finger and that has a definite risk of uh, annual risk of hemorrhage. Okay, and this risk adds up every year that you're alive. So if you're going to, uh, you know, live another 30, 40 years, the risk of this aneurysm will be different for you than if, let's say, your life expectancy is a year or two still. Lastly, the 20 millimeter aneurysm is about the width of a penny, and this is the most dangerous aneurysm. This has about a 50% chance of rupturing or causing severe permanent disability or death over the, uh, within just two years. So we take these very seriously. So the size of the aneurysm is critical. Five millimeters is my cutoff in my practice for when we decide to, to get serious about treating these aneurysms. There are other features about the aneurysm that, that are important in making these decisions. Uh, the shape of the aneurysm, if it's got a nice, smooth, spherical shape to it, that tells us that it's growing in a very controlled fashion. And the risk of that bleeding tends to be a little bit less than an aneurysm that has multiple small lobules to it, uh, or aneurysms that have a very jagged appearance uh, on these imaging studies. Additionally, if the aneurysm looks like it's one of those blood blister aneurysms, they tend to bleed at a much smaller size, and we take those extremely seriously. Aneurysms that have calcium inside their walls or actual significant amounts of blood clot also pose uh, uh, additional challenges to us. Blood goes into an aneurysm, swirls around, and comes out of the aneurysm and can, can have access to the rest of the brain. So if there is a lot of clot inside the aneurysm, there is a chance that a piece of that clot will break off and enter the circulation and actually act as an embolism to cause a stroke. So we take those aneurysms especially seriously too. So how do we go about uh, uh, treating these aneurysms? Well, for all those aneurysms that are s small that we find to be of no threat to the patient, the best thing to do is to just monitor those and non-invasive imaging is the safest way to do it. So we get one angiogram we, we get an exacting picture of what the aneurysm looks like, and if we determine that the aneurysm small doesn't pose any threat to the patient, then we can just follow that along with an MRA so the patient doesn't have to get any radiation or die. If, however, we decide that we need to treat this aneurysm, then we have to have the conversation of how do we treat this aneurysm. There is two general categories that we have for treating aneurysms. There's the endovascular treatment, which is treating the aneurysm from inside the blood vessels. And this can be done with coiling, with stent-assisted coiling, or with these new uh, flow-diverting stents. Or there is the open surgery. And this can be done with either directly attacking the aneurysm or bypassing the blood around the aneurysm, so you take the aneurysm out of the equation. And I'd like to go through that very uh, briefly and show you some, some images of that. So the endovascular option, treating the aneurysm from the inside, how do we do this? Well, basically, the concept here is to keep blood from going into the inside of the aneurysm. There's two ways you can do that. One, you fill, you pack the aneurysm with, with <coughs> stuff, and that stuff happens to be platinum, very fine platinum coils, uh, and you pack it so fully that there's no room for blood to come into the aneurysm anymore. 
and over time the body will actually heal across that pack of coils and will eliminate the aneurysm uh, from the circulation. We now have this uh, state-of-the-art um, uh, neurointerventional suite. Uh, oh, we don't have an internet connection here, do we? Well, we have the biplane uh, angiography suite uh, at the <coughs> Duke Raleigh Hospital. This, is, this was recently installed, and it's absolutely vital for the treatment of, of these aneurysms endovascularly. And in that Healthy Focus uh, magazine, there is an overview of the, of the lab, and there is a website where you can go and actually see the lab. Basically, the idea here is that we have a table which we can move in a very precise fashion, and we have x-ray cameras in two planes, one looking at the head from above to below and one looking at the head from side to side. So that at any time when we step on the x-ray, we can see in two planes or two dimensions what we're doing with this catheter. So let me show you an example of how we treat an aneurysm with, a, with this endovascular technique. This is uh, an angiogram uh, looking through the right eye uh, at the right side of the head. We've injected dye into the carotid artery, which is the large artery in the front of the neck that takes blood to the vast majority of the brain, brain material. And here the dye is, is darkened the blood vessel, and you can see it coming up into the head and branching into all these different branches. This large vessel coming out here is the middle cerebral artery. And at the end of that, you can see this large bubble. That's the aneurysm, uh, and that's, like I said, at a bifurcation point. The artery comes up to here and splits into two branches, and that's where the aneurysm is formed. Now, when we go to do the endovascular treatment, we want to fill this aneurysm full of coils. The shape of the aneurysm can determine how easy that will be. If the aneurysm is shaped like a balloon, where it has a very small neck and a wide dome, it's pretty easy to just pack it with the coils, because if you put the coils in there, the small neck will keep the coils inside the aneurysm. But this is a wide-necked aneurysm. You can see the aneurysm is as wide down here at its base as it is up here at its top. What that means is if we put a coil in there that's big enough to fill this aneurysm, it has a very good chance of coming down through this wide opening and blocking one of the parent vessels. One of these two branches can be blocked by the aneurysm. And the consequence of that is a stroke. We can get around that by using a stent. So this is a video from, uh, this is what we see in the angio suite when we're doing one of these procedures. We've taken a small wire up through the leg and put it in one of those branches the upper branch. And now I'm advancing a little device, a stent, which is being opened up inside these blood vessels. Here's the distal end of the stent, and here's the proximal end of the stent. You can see it just sprung open. And then I can go through that stent with my catheter and start putting these coils of platinum into the aneurysm. And the idea is this stent acts like a scaffolding to keep these coils from coming into one of those parent vessels and occluding them, okay? Now, unfortunately, that didn't happen in this instance because this first stent, which went from this vessel into the upper vessel, protected the upper vessel, but you can see right here, there is a little, little herniation of the coils into the lower vessel, okay? And we're doing this all real time. We can see this happening uh, on the x-ray machine. So very quickly, we just go up, with another stent device, and here it is in the lower, lower vessel, and you can see how right there, when it opened up, it pushed the coils back into the inside of the aneurysm. Okay, so you have to be very, you have to pay a lot of attention when you're doing these uh, procedures, and you have to have all the right equipment to, to be able to s do it properly and with, with the least risk uh, to the patient. Um, why, why platinum coils, and how many of these have you done? Uh, we do, I've done probably 400 so far. Platinum is nice because it's very soft. They can, they can uh, actually weave it into such a fine strand that uh, it, it has a very low risk of pushing through this thin wall uh, at the dome of the aneurysm. And as you can see on this, uh, on this and, and you can see better, 
on this next x-ray. This is just a standard x-ray. It's very dense. So it, it, it scatters the x-ray beam very, very nicely, which allows you to see exactly where every little bit uh, of the platinum is going. And, okay? And there's no rejection of that? Platinum. Right. There is no rejection of that. Unlike other metals, for example, nickel, which, which are allergenic, platinum is, is not. Okay? You. And, and you can see, in contrast to the platinum, the material that the stents are made out of, it, you can't really see it very well. And that's why they put these little markers on the ends of them, so you have a sense of where exactly your stent is going. Did this, a strand of platinum ever break? Yeah, the cause of the problem. It, it, the, no, the, the, the actual coil itself doesn't break. Um, what, has, what I have seen is that uh, the actual, uh, if it's not sized properly, the, the actual ball of coils can come out and move um, into another blood vessel. So this is how you treat a wide neck aneurysm if you want to pack it off from the inside. Uh, as of uh, uh, 2011, there has been a new concept in the endovascular treatment, and, and these slides are from a different institution, but the idea is to just divert the blood flow away from the aneurysm. So instead of having a stent that acts just as a scaffold to keep your coils inside the aneurysm, you have a stent that's such a tightly woven mesh of, of material that when you place it across an aneurysm, it actually doesn't let the blood go through its walls. And uh, this is an example of a before and after picture of an um, a aneurysm treated with that device. And we've been using that device now at, at uh, Duke Raleigh uh, as well. And uh, it's actually allowed us to treat some aneurysms which we had uh, no other good way of treating uh, with, with a catheter. So that's the um, endovascular management of aneurysms. Um, and now I want to talk about um, the surgical clipping. We have a new uh, dedicated operating theater designed to meet the specific needs for of complex neurosurgical uh, procedures, uh, and that includes aneurysm clipping. Uh, and we also have very good anesthesia capabilities to help get a patient through that. Now, with uh, aneurysm clipping, the idea here is to open the skull, directly visualize the aneurysm, separate the branches from the neck of the aneurysm, all those little branches that I had to treat with the stents before, you can directly see those and separate those from the aneurysm and place a clip, a titanium clip, across the neck of the aneurysm in such a way to keep blood from getting into the inside of the <clears throat> aneurysm while preserving the patency or the openness uh, of those two branches. And we do all of this work under the surgical microscope. This is very meticulous surgery, uh, and uh, it's actually very difficult surgery, but, uh, so it's important to have uh, the, the training in it. So this is what you see when you look um, under the microscope. There is, this is the main blood vessel coming up through here, and it's branching into this main trunk here and this smaller trunk uh, up here. This is my little suction device. This thing going across the aneurysm is a vein. Now, I, as a rule, I try not to injure any of these uh, blood vessels when operating. You can see that this blood vessel actually has a white uh, color to its wall, and that's because of calcium. Uh, and this is actually a patient who developed a stroke from this calcium going, going into, into the head, and that's how we found out that she had an aneurysm. So in this instance, trying to pack a bunch of platinum into the inside of this aneurysm, which already was showering debris into her brain, didn't make any sense, right? That's not a good option uh, for her. What we need to do is directly clip and eliminate the aneurysm. And so this is the aneurysm clip uh, coming into view here. And um, you can see the, the other issue with some aneurysm especially the ones that have calcium in their walls, is that they can be so firm that these clips won't close on the aneurysm. And one of the things that we've pioneered here uh, is the ability to temporarily stop the heart. Uh, and when you do that, the pressure inside the aneurysm goes away. There is no longer that kick from the heart 
to keep the aneurysm tense, and that allows you to place a clip on the aneurysm. So um, here I get ready to, to position the clip, and then we'll, well, you can see the aneurysm beating still. We've stopped the heart now, and once the heart is stopped, you can see how soft the aneurysm becomes, uh, and you can place this clip, preserve the patency of all the little branches around it, uh, and then we restart the heart. And um, you can see right, uh, this all takes less than 30 seconds, and there's the first beats, and now the heart's back, and the aneurysm's been, been secured. Uh, so this is one of the things we do here that, that no one else does, uh, and it's really changed our ability to treat some giant aneurysms, calcified aneurysms, thrombosed aneurysms. And that's the other key point uh, about having people who are sort of leaders in the field uh, doing uh, these operations. This is what happens when, and, and this is just, just a bit of editorialization, but there's lots of different people who have practices where they put coils into aneurysms. And when they get into trouble, they send the patients to us. And here is an example of an aneurysm that had been coiled at an outlying facility. You can sort of see the, the mass of coils here. This aneurysm had bled, bled again after the patient had the coils placed, bled again while um, this is my former partner and I, Dr. Britz, were, were doing this surgery together. Uh, so the aneurysm uh, bleeds again, and it just becomes much more complex, complicated to definitively be able to treat it. And you'll see what we have to do is actually cut the aneurysm open and take out these old coils that weren't doing their, their job. And so I just wanted to put this in here so you can see, you've seen what the coils look like going in. This is what the coils look like coming out. They're just this strand, and it's almost like a spring um, loaded into the inside of the aneurysm. And again, the re because this, this mass of coils was in there, uh, it was impossible for us to get a clip across there to seal it off. So the only alternative was to take out all of these coils to empty out the inside of the aneurysm and then definitively clip off the aneurysm. And fortunately, the patient did, did very well uh, with this, but this is, this is another thing that you have to be able to do in order to properly take care of a patient with a brain aneurysm. It's not sufficient to just do one type of technique or, or another. So this is clipping as salvage after, uh, after an aneurysm's been um, partially coiled. And then you have the brain damage at the time like that. Neuroanesthesia. Uh, so what we do uh, when when an aneurysm is bleeding and when you have to open an aneurysm, you have to temporarily stop the flow of blood uh, into the blood vessel that the aneurysm is on, and we so temporarily clip off the blood vessel that the aneurysm is coming off. Now what that does is it decreases the blood flow to all of the brain distal or beyond the point that the aneurysm's been, that the blood vessel's been clipped, right? That means that there's less oxygen and less nutrients getting to, to that part of the brain. So what we can do with good anesthesia, we actually can decrease the what we call the metabolic rate of oxygen consumption by the brain to almost zero. And that gives us some time to be able to do things like this to be able to temporarily stop the heart, to be able to temporarily clip off a, a large blood vessel. It, and that's, that's the other thing. Sometimes, despite our best precautions and best efforts, and uh, Lord knows I've had, we've all had our fair share of cases where you do everything perfectly and some completely unrelated thing happens, but you, at the end of the day, the thing that allows you to keep doing this is that you know what you're doing and you do the right thing. You take every precaution you can on every patient uh, because basically we're treating diseases that could otherwise be fatal. Well, clip, clipping, do you have to open the skull or can yes. you do it internally? No, no, well, we open the skull. So usually for, for, for aneurysms on the anterior circulation, there's an incision that starts just in front of the ear and curves up um, uh, the scalp right, right to the basically to the midpoint. We try to hide it behind the hairline. I try to not shave, especially for ladies, at, at all the hair. We can just part the hair and, and cover it. And 
for most people, once the hair comes back, you can't really see uh, the incision. Uh, for uh, aneurysms in the, in the posterior circulation, the incisions can vary. They can go straight up from in front of the ear, or they can be actually behind the ear. But in every case, when you want to do surgery on an aneurysm in the head, you have to open the skull to get access uh, uh, to the blood vessels. Uh, the last thing, and again, sort of the other cutting edge thing that we do here is for these giant aneurysms that are not coilable and not clippable. This was in a young 16-year-old uh, girl who actually had a seizure uh, because this aneurysm was so large. And you can get a sense of that. This space here is where the temp one of the lobes of the brain needs to reside. The temporal lobe of the brain needs to result. And you can see that entire space is filled with this aneurysm. We, when I was telling you the sizes, we stopped at, at 20 millimeters, the size of, of, a, of a penny, the, di the width of a penny. This aneurysm was actually five centimeters, so 50 millimeters. Uh, so two and a half pennies uh, put next to each other. And it basically filled the entire, uh, actually the left side of her brain. And she had a seizure because the brain was just compressed so, ba so badly by it. So now you look at this aneurysm and you say, okay, what, what am I going to do with this? I told you guys that this is basically an aneurysm that's fatal within two years. And this is a young 16-year-old girl you're looking at. Uh, is there a way we can clip this, uh, coil this aneurysm? Well, no, we can't coil this aneurysm because you see right there, one of these branches, or actually two of the branches that are supplying all the blood to the left side of her brain. This is the side of her brain that allows her to understand language allows her to talk, allows her to move her right arm, allows her to move her right leg, allows her to do math. All of that is being supplied by these two blood vessels coming out of this aneurysm. So I can't fill this thing up with coils because I would lose those aneurysms. And there's no way I can put a stent across there that will protect both of those blood vessels. So that option is not on the I can't do the flow diversion uh, to technique because that stent can only protect one blood vessel. So I could put it from here to here, and then I would lose that, and she could have a, have a stroke. So that's off the table. Can I clip this aneurysm? Well, this is a giant aneurysm. There is no way, even if I stop her heart, that I can get a clip to close across this. And besides, if I do, there's all these little blood vessels here that I can't see, which would just disappear in, into my clip. So what can we do for her? Well, we can bypass her. And this is what, what I did. Uh, basically, this is the big temporal artery, which we all have, and you can actually feel it most of the time, especially if you get angry, um, that supplies your scalp here. Uh, and it's got two big branches. So we open her head. I took off a piece of bone here to create a window and took the two branches of this vessel that were supposed to supply her scalp and, and cut them and sewed them into the sides of those two branches coming off the aneurysm. And this is what it looks like uh, at the end. So you can see the two branches going in here and you can see here they come, they come in and they reconstitute those two big blood vessels that were coming out of this aneurysm. And once you do that, then you can just put a clip proximal to the aneurysm so no more blood can get into it. So you, you bypass, keep, keep nutrition going to the brain, and get rid of the aneurysm. And she actually went to her prom uh, two months after this, um, after this surgery, uh, which was a, a, a real big deal for me. So that's the end of it. I hope that gives you all a good idea of everything we can do for brain aneurysms. It's a scary diagnosis, but we have lots of ways to treat them, both very invasively and non-invasively. Um, and if any of you have any questions, please let me know.